Good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to this webinar that's being hosted by ASE and the Ed, ASE Education Foundation. Uh, as Dave said, I'm John Tisdale, Vice President of ASE Special Testing Programs. Um, on behalf of ASE, I want to I want to welcome everyone joining us today. Uh, we know that all of you are interested in learning as much as you can to keep your diagnostic and repair skills sharp. But sometimes, though, you know, we can always forget about some of the more f fundamental topics. And that's what today's session is all about. This week, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Chris Aiello. He's research and development scientist at WD40 Company. Uh, Chris is going to discuss the science of tribology with us today. And that's uh, the science which deals with friction, wear, and lubrication. So going to be a new spin on some, some topics maybe that we've always taken for granted in our in our careers here working on vehicles. So with no further ado, Chris, go ahead and take it away. All right, how's everyone doing today? I know you can't respond, but I hope everyone's doing well. Um, thank you, John, for the introduction. And I wanna thank the ASE Education Foundation as well for allowing us to host this session. As John alluded to, we're going to talk a lot about uh, tri tribology today, and we're gonna get in more detail what tribology is. Um, but really the, the title of our presentation is Getting the Job Done Right. Uh, as you know, WD-40 Company, what we do for a living, you, you probably think that we sell oil for a living, but that's not really what we do. What we do is we sell positive lasting memories, and those memories are sold through the problems that are solved in the workshops around the world. And so the automotive industry is a big part of those memories. Uh, I'm sure everyone here can remember a time uh, working on a bike or working on a car, maybe with dad, maybe with grandpa, and uh, having some great memories. So that's what we're really talking about today. Before, before we get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation, I wanna go back in time and tell you a little bit about how WD-40 Company started. So it was 1953 uh, that the company started in San Diego, California. And it turns out that it wasn't called WD-40 Company on the onset, it was called Rocket Chemical Company. And the reason why I have a missile uh, as a picture there is the, the advent of WD-40 was the Atlas Space Program that was taking place in San Diego. And the engineers that were work, working on these rockets and missiles at the time had a big issue that they were dealing with. Once these missiles reached atmos the atmosphere at a certain um, altitude, they were experiencing corrosion on the outer shell of the rocket. And so what they did is they put a bid out into the local county to find a solution to this problem. And three scientists got together and it took them 40 attempts to get a water displacement formula. And there was born the WD-40 name, right? Water displacement 40th attempt. And so what happened is uh, WD a rocket chemical company formed and specifically made solutions for rockets. And what happened uh, as a quick story is that the managers noticed that employees were taking the product home. They were essentially stealing it in their lunch boxes. And instead of getting angry, uh, they asked the employees why they were taking it home. And the answer to that question led to the market boom we saw. And then in 1973, we renamed the company after our, our only product, which is WD-40. So now we're the WD-40 company. So who am I? Uh, so again, nice to meet you, Chris Aiello. I'm an R&D scientist, uh, actually a chemist by training. Uh, I am trained by the Rutgers University. I have a bachelor's degree and I'm um, almost done with my master's education as well. But a little, lo and behold, I'm also a, a, I also hold, have held an ASE certification. Um, obviously the certifications expire, so I no longer have a active uh, certification, but there was a time that I was actively engaged with uh, as an auto mechanic. And so I've, I have a passion for cars, I have a passion for modifying them. Here's some of the vehicles that I've owned over time. Um, and this uh, ties in quite well with my um, new product development focus in the company, as well as the education part, which I lead in the R&D department, uh, which is exactly what we're doing today. So let's jump in. So tribology, it turns out tribology is a real study. It's a study of friction, wear, and lubrication. And more specifically, it's looking at surfaces in relative motion. Uh, so you could think of, you know, the classic examples around your house, you know, door hinges, right? Uh, or um, drawers, uh, obviously there's mechanisms in there that need, that need lubrication over time, sliding doors. 
And then in the vehicle, all the typical suspects, again, you have doors and whatnot, but you have the pistons, uh, all the mecha uh, mechanics and then transmission. And you have some simple stuff uh, that may corrode over time uh, on the exhaust manifold, for example. So we're gonna talk about all those aspects and all the uh, parameters that play a role in tribology and how WD-40 Company can help you understand uh, how to avoid a high degree of wear, how to properly lubricate and how to prevent corrosion. So again, just a quick recap, there's really three pillars to tribology, there's friction. And so you um, obviously are trying to avoid friction or reduce the amount of friction that's occurring in any mechanism. Where, right, so we all know this from uh, cars and automotive, it, you know, use motor oil to reduce the wear on say piston rings uh, in order to keep those pistons moving as efficiently as possible and also increase your mileage. Lubrication in general, again, motor oil, but uh, there's a lot of other areas uh, in the world actually you can think of lubrication. It even gets distilled down to simple applications such as conditioner for your hair. Uh, those uh, molecules actually coat your hair fibers and they prevent uh, your hair follicles from becoming intertwined. And so that's an area of tribology as well. And then it goes all the way to metal cutting, metal fabrication, automotive. Um, it could even be production lines where you have conveyor belts and whatnot. So uh, in tribology, you really find it everywhere. And so it's a really broad uh, study. So to start, I, wanna, I wanted to start really basic about what surfaces look like. And so the image I have on the next slide here is I took a steel panel brand new from the stamping line ex extruded, uh, no tampering, uh, nothing, you know, basically this surface is a virgin material. So there's been nothing that's come in contact with it. And what I did is I took a scanning electron microscopy image. And what those images do is they look really close at the topography of the surface of the metal. And if you can see the blown up image there, you can see that actually a surface of metal, even though it feels flat and smooth to the hand, uh, there's a lot of ridges and valleys that you could clearly see. And what does this mean? Well, if you can imagine two of these surfaces coming into contact with one another, you'd get a lot of wear, you get a lot of friction, and you generate a lot of heat because all those peaks are coming in contact with one another. And so what we've learned is over time, and humans have been avoiding this, is that no surfaces are truly flat. And in fact, the, only, the flattest surface that man has ever made is the mirrors on the Hubble Space Telescope. The other aspect of surface topology and, uh, tr and tribology in general is corrosion. So just again to the science of corrosion, just briefly, uh, it's actually an electrochemical process, meaning uh, there's a transfer of electrons. I know we all took chemistry back in high school, but uh, on the top left, you can see the little pictogram where you have to have some type of substrate, iron, that's willing to give up its electrons. It doesn't have to be iron, could be aluminum, it could be copper, it could be brass, right? We've all seen corrosion on copper, it's that green material, uh, and aluminum has more of a white, flaky material. And iron is obviously that classic orange, red, rust color. But anyway, uh, what happens is you need really three ingredients, the iron, which is the substrate, or other metals. You need oxygen, which acts as your oxidant. Uh, and obviously oxygen is really hard to avoid because you find it in the atmosphere. And then water, right? And what, what happens is they facilitate the transfer of electrons away from iron and onto a cathode, right? And so what does that mean? Well, iron is transformed into an oxide and that's where the oxygen comes, comes in. You can see Fe2O3, that's iron oxide, which is actually rust. And what happens is you pit one area, that's why it says pitting on the left, and then you create a positive rust in another area. And so going back to the previous slide, you can imagine if you had a lot of rust occurring on a surface, these peaks and valleys would be much more dramatic. And so preventing corrosion and treating corrosion is a big part of tribology as well. So, okay, lubrication. Why do we need to lubricate in the first place? Well, I, I hinted to this a little bit already. Uh, the first thing is it provides a layer to separate the surfaces in relative motion. It creates a physical barrier, uh, so those peaks and valleys don't come in contact. Again, reducing friction and wear. It acts as a coolant in many cases. So this is important for metal fabrication and metal, metal cutting applications. Uh, you need the dyes to be cool because they will last longer. And even in an engine, you can imagine uh, your coolant, uh, that actually acts as a lubricant to a certain degree. And it's also cooling all the surfaces inside of your, uh, of your automotive, of your car. Uh, protect from corrosion. I just mentioned how corrosion is bad uh, for, for lubrication, or sorry, bad for wear and tear as well. Uh, so having an oil on there uh, creates a physical barrier against the elements as well as oxygen. 
And the last thing is carry away debris. So it actually washes the surface. Uh, so you don't have contaminants that may actually add to the wear and tear that's happening. And so the, the image on the bottom left, uh, the, the three bubbles that you see there, you can see a difference between a good oil supply and impaired oil supply, and then just straight up dry friction. And so this is why over time, the automotive industry has really pushed uh, lubricants and motor oils to the highest degree, because it's so important for the longevity of your vehicle and the parts, as well as mileage. And lubricants have improved over time. And so um, this is my current vehicle, so I'm a little biased here, but I'm just providing uh, what the manual suggests. And so right now, if you were to look at the manual of a, of a recent car, typically they recommend 10,000 miles. I know it varies depending on the car you have. Uh, the steering system, they actually don't recommend you do anything. They just say, lube for life, uh, leave it alone. And then uh, how often do you lubricate transmission? Roughly 10, or sorry, 100,000 miles. I decided, well, let me go back 100 years and see what that looks like. So 100 years ago, if you were to look at a manual of a Deluxe Maxwell, they would recommend changing the oil every 100 miles. Every time you drive to grandma's house, you have to change the oil in your car. Um, kind of amazing the amount of uh, progress we've had in, in chemical technology to get to where we're at today. Uh, steering system 500 miles and then transmission 2000 miles. Um, and just a quick fact, I was at a, a conference with uh, Exxon and they were talking about the, some of the latest and greatest technology they're working on regarding oils. And a lot of them are algae based oils, so they're bio based oils. And they're getting test results that suggest you can actually keep the oil in your car for 50,000 miles. And so we're going in the right direction. I think the 10,000 miles will become a thing of the past even 50 years from now. And so I want to get into more uh, specifics about the type of chemistry and science that I deal with in terms of tribology and also the, some of the products that WD-40 company offers. But really the type of lubricants that as an automotive professional you may encounter in the marketplace and that may help you do your job. So you have your multi-purpose lubricants. You've seen the blue and yellow can. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. You have your penetrants. Uh, these are used for loosening up those rusted mechanisms. Your heavy duty gel based formulations, which are actually a bit unique to WD-40 company. And you can see the second image on the bottom. Um, it basically is a, th think of gel WD-40. Uh, that's really what it is. It's just a souped up WD-40 has much higher performance. We'll get into more detail in a little bit. You have your silicones. I'm sure everyone here is uh, familiar with silicones and their applications. We'll get, again, I have a slide, a set of slides for that. White lithium grease is great for creating that barrier I was talking about. It's a more robust barrier because it's thicker. Uh, so grease is always a better uh, barrier than a liquid lubricant. And then you have your dry lubricants, and we're going to talk more about that as well. Before we get into that, though, when we're developing a product, how do you know it works? I mean, you, okay, I'm a scientist, so I put the chemicals together. And what do I do to determine that our product may be better than a competitor or that the product works in general? Well, we have a series of laboratory uh, standard test methods that are performed under controlled conditions. And so the first one I want set that I want to talk to you about are the lubrication standard test methods. So here are two pieces of equipment that we actually have in our lab in New Jersey. The one on the left is an extreme pressure apparatus it's, uh, under ASTM D3233. So ASTM is the American standard of testing in materials. So these are American uh, test standards and they're part of the automotive series. So actually the automotive industry uh, kind of influences the way that we develop products. That's why uh, we're uh, deep, deeply involved with the automotive industry. But anyway, on the left, what does it look like? So you would have two V blocks uh, and then they would be pressing down on a pin. Now the two V blocks are not installed in the image and neither is the pin, uh, but the pin goes in that middle uh, vertical cylinder it gets inserted there and then the v-blocks go into those two holes that you could see that would close in around that pin uh, then there's a cup that holds your test fluid and what happens is you run the test and over time more pressure is added to the pin by the v-blocks and eventually that pin will snap or it'll break and the rating is the amount of pressure at which that pin broke so obviously a higher rating is better on the right is the four ball wear test under ASTM D4172. And I tried to blow up an image of the, the ball bearings on the right there. But basically you have four ball bearings. The three ball bearings on the bottom create a cavity for the fourth ball to be introduced on top. The fourth ball is spun at 1200 RPMs for 60 minutes. And what you do after 60 minutes is you take the uh, apparatus apart 
And uh, by the way, these uh, four ball bearings are again submerged in your test fluid. And you take them to a microscope and you actually measure the width and the height of the scars and you take an average. And obviously a smaller scar is better. And so that gives you an indication of your anti-wear properties. For corrosion testing, we run the ASTM B117. And the image on the left is an actual salt spray chamber in our lab. And so on the right of that chamber, you could see some tanks uh, that hold salt water solution. It's 5% sodium chloride. And then the inside of that uh, bath uh, looks like the image on the right. Uh, and basically it's very simple. You have steel Q panels that you dip into your test solution. You put them at a uh, 20 degree angle inside this, app, uh, this salt chamber. And then you run it uh, and you check it typically every 24 hours. It depends on your attendance in the lab. Uh, but I can tell you a product like WD-40, which is a corrosion inhibitor, will get about 168 hours on this test. And so a lot of people usually ask me, well, what's good and good and bad? Uh, most multi-purpose lubricants that we've tested very rarely make it to 48 hours. Um, so, you know, 168, we're quite proud of that number. And we could talk more about um, corrosion data later. The last two I have on here is the ASTM B4488, which is the Gardner Scrubability Test. Uh, real quick, this is, you can see the yellow sponge that's on the oscillating arm there. You could oscillate the arm at any speed you like. Um, and the amount of oscillations is also determined by the operator. And then the substrate can be, again, anything you want. We use steel, vinyl, ceramic, and you can also use any soil you like, but there are standardized soils like heavy duty soils, kitchen-based soils. And you'd run this test and you use a reflectometer to determine how much soil was there before and after, and uh, you get a score for cleaning. Uh, the last test is penetration, and this is an industry standard test, so there's no uh, standardized test method for this. And so what you do is you take nail studs, you sandblast them, that's why they have that gray color, and then you mark them every centimeter, and so you can see the, the markings uh, with a Sharpie. You, paste, you place a specified volume of your test fluid in a beaker, and you drop the nails in at the same time, and you simply test uh, you know, distance versus time. Uh, so this is a industry standard again, so it's not uh, as scientific as we'd all like it to be sometimes, uh, but it's very useful for, for you know, when you're developing a penetrant to determine which penetrant not only goes the furthest, but reacts the fastest. So let's go into penetrants a little bit more and the science behind it. So what is a penetrant? Um, I'm sure everyone has seen these uh, bugs if they were swimming in a lake or something like that. Um, and you, if you were like me, I used to ask myself, well, how are they floating on the water? You know, what is suspending them? Uh, because obviously the bug's density is, is got to be more than water, right? And the truth of the matter is, if you were to look at the legs of this bug, you can see the water actually wrapping around the legs, and almost creating like a sticky surface uh, for this bug. And that's exactly the reason uh, why this bug can actually stay on the surface. It spreads its legs and the water uh, provides almost like a support system for the bug. This is not good for a penetrant. We don't want penetrants to stick to surfaces. We want them to spread and we want them to have a lot of energy. And so what we do is we develop liquids that move quickly by the by uh, capillary action and we add wetting agents and solvents to lower the surface tension. So a lower surface tension is, a, is an indication of a better penetrant and you want it to be able to spread, like I said, as fastly as possible. And the ultimate goal is to reduce the amount of torque required to loosen parts, you know. So you, I'm sure everyone here has had rusted uh, oil pan bolts or exhaust manifold bolts that uh, were really a problem. Maybe they were exposed for too long uh, or it's an older vehicle. And so we spray penetrants on them. You might wait, you might eat lunch and come back. And then that bolt is much easier to remove because, again, we're, we're spraying the product on there. It's creeping into those tight spaces and lubricating to help with the reduce the amount of torque required. Here's another pictogram uh, that I chose just to show what water surface tension looks like. If you were to dip a rod into a glass of water, you would see it stick. Uh, with a penetrant, you don't want that. You want the opposite of that. You want to spread as quickly as possible. So again, ability to spread, low surface tension. You want to be able to displace water, right? So you don't want the problem happening again. The, the problem arose from corrosion. And so a great penetrant would have some sense of, or some type of corrosion protection properties to it. Lubricity is important, so you can prevent or reduce the amount of torque required. No harsh or toxic fumes is an important one. I, I get this question a lot, and I've got, gotten it over the years when I've 
presented at ASC. And so a lot of people ask me, you know, I have a penetrant and when I spray it in my shop, the whole entire shop smells for hours and I have to ventilate. To be honest with you, you, you really got to be careful with these types of products. Most of the time they are harsh and they could be toxic. And so the last uh, bullet point here talks about safety and compliance, California Prop 65. Um, it's important to review safety data sheets for the products that you're using, especially products that you use very often. And because these harsh fumes might be affecting your uh, respiratory system. So I highly recommend when you're, especially when you're using penetrants and products that use to a high degree, brake cleaner and things like that, take a look, go online, Google the product and read the SDS. They're typically publicly available and make sure they do not have California Pop 65. Uh, you can find that information in section uh, 14 of the SDS. Uh, this slide, again, just talking about torque, uh, it's a rotational force. So obviously you think of ratchets and those types of tools. Uh, we want to reduce the amount of torque uh, when applying a penetrant. So we could pass this slide. We, we kind of uh, breeze through this one. So the next set of products I want to talk about today is the high performance gel lubricants. Uh, this one's a bit unique to WD-40 company. There's not a lot of uh, products out there that, or companies out there that offer gel lubricants. I would categorize them. Uh, I put high performance here. They are better performance than your multi-use products. Uh, they have different applications. As you can see the image, it sets up more as a semi-solid. Uh, so it's like a soft uh, liquid rather than a, a runny liquid. And it's great for those vertical surfaces. It's great if you're underneath a car and you're spraying pivot points uh, and you don't want it to drip on your shop floor or drip on you. Uh, so th that, that was kind of the genesis of this uh, particular product. And so let's go into the chemistry a little bit. So I just wanted to show some images of uh, what the product looks like when it's applied, what type of applications it has. So really it's a soft uh, transparent gel film. And again, similar to the white lithium grease, it does seal out the elements. It seals out the moisture and air and the corrosive elements. It provides protection from uh, corrosion as well. Uh, but it's just a much longer lasting protection. So you can get up to a year of protection with a product like this. Um, you get 12 times longer lasting lubrication than you would with a typical multi-use product. And so it's really great for chains, um, even for bicycle chains, if you're going to be uh, riding and maybe going out in the elements for a while. And so th this is where you get the uniqueness of the Spray and Stay Gel Lubricant because it's, uh, again, it's a high performance product meant for those, high per uh, those applications where you need high performance lubrication. The science behind it is quite interesting. So we looked at, uh, you know, tomato ketchup and sunscreen, for example. What goes on in there? I'm sure everyone, uh, you know, when you're eating hot dogs and hamburgers, uh, you you take a bottle of ketchup and you shake it quite a bit, and then it seems to be a little bit more liquidy, or, or as we say, less viscous, right? So viscosity is a measure of flow of a of a particular liquid. If it's less viscous, it has more of a uh, liquid. Uh, feel to it. If it's more highly viscous, it would have more of a viscosity of honey. And so it's ketchup, if you shake the bottle quite a bit, it'll thin, thin it out, right? Sunscreen has the same properties. And so we decided to take that technology and move it over to uh, lubricants. And we, when you apply it, it works out quite well. So the, the gel formula that we developed is essentially WD-40 uh, using these thixotropic uh, polymers. And what happens is you shake the can, there's a ball bearing inside the can that adds the agitation of the product and it helps thin it out so you could spray it. But when it hits the surface or whatever you're applying it to, it actually sets up quite nice. It thickens up a little bit. And so it doesn't drip, it doesn't run and it stays where you spray it. So again, you apply energy, could be heat, uh, but in this case, we're just shaking and uh, adding more agitation with that ball bearing in the aerosol can. And so uh, here's an application I wanted to show everyone uh, and someone in the automotive actually spraying a pivot point. Uh, again, it sets up quite nice. You can see that the spray, as soon as it hits the surface, it actually builds up. It doesn't run, it doesn't drip. Uh, and it's quite nice for uh, those areas that are gonna get exposed to a high degree, especially underneath the car, uh, where you could be over the winter time exposing it to the elements, uh, salted roads and whatnot. Uh, I know up by me in Jersey that this is a product that I use all the time. So you know, when I go underneath the car to an oil change, I don't get upset at looking at all the corrosion that's happened over the past year. Uh, so in the automotive industry, uh, control arm bushings and pivots. And like I said, it provides longer lasting lubrication and corrosion protection as well. So I, I told you earlier that we're gonna talk about dry lubricants uh, and the technology that goes into them as well. So there's really three main 
uh, additives that you'll find in the marketplace. There's PTFE. Uh, you may have heard this as Teflon. So PTFE actually stands for polytetrafluoroethylene, and that's the molecule there. N is just the, the amount of polymer that exists. So it could be any number. The, the higher that number is, the bigger the polymer is. Uh, but the image on the bottom really uh, illustrates well what actually goes on when using these solid lubricant additives. You could think of these additives as molecular ball bearings, again, that provide a barrier between two surfaces in relative motion. It prevents them from coming into contact. Uh, they don't do much in corrosion protection, uh, but they are great at certain applications, right? So when you have a dry lubricant, uh, let's say you're a carpenter or you're a metal machinist, you're maybe you're uh, cutting metal and you have metal shavings flying around. Uh, you may you may not want a uh, liquid surface that the shavings and contaminants can stick to. And so what's nice about dry lubricants is you could suspend them in fast drying uh, solvents, and then these solvents, and when you apply the product, they dry within 10 to 20 seconds, and all they leave behind are these dry uh, solid lubricants. And so that's why they're used, and that's their specific application. The other uh, additive is molybdenum disulfide. That's the material in the middle of the black uh, sand looking material. Um, again, it's a great additive, additive but both uh, molybdenum and graphite, uh, one of the downfalls is that they create a black. Uh, coloration of your fluid. And so when you spray on the surface, it's going to discolor the surface. So we typically use PTFE. Um, it gives us the same performance and it's a cleaner application. Uh, we talked about silicone earlier. So this is uh, a little bit about silicone. On the top left, you can see uh, what how it comes when you order the raw material in a drum. It's really viscous, almost like a honey viscosity. And so you don't use a lot of it. You use uh, it in a, a product as an additive. Again, it's not, uh, a product's never based on a silicone. Um, otherwise you wouldn't be able to spray it out of a can or, or you know, use it. It wouldn't be able to flow through your engine components properly if you use it just as is its raw material uh, physical appearance. And so you use it as an additive and it's used in many industries. So we talked about lubricants, but it's used in cosmetics, a lot of, um, Makeup uses uh, polydimethyl siloxane on the bottom left as a uh, coating material. Hair conditioner, anti-foaming agent, even uh, toys, a silly putty, which is on the bottom right image, and dielectric greases. And so the reason why silicone uh, additive is so great is they provide much higher operating range than your typical hydrocarbon-based materials. And so just going to, just to review some high school chemistry, hydrocarbon is uh, materials like pet petroleum-based chemicals, right? Uh, gasoline and uh, um, you know all those uh, petrol-type uh, chemistry is hydrocarbon-based. Silicone-based is a, a better performance in general than the hydrocarbon in the sense, like I said, higher operating temperature. So, uh, for example, our silicone lubricant goes up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit in operating temperature and as low as negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit. They also, they also have a bit more uh, flexibility. Uh, the bonds that you see there in between the silicon and the oxygen bond are a bit more flexible because they're longer bonds. And so there's just better features and physical characteristics to silicones, and that's why they're utilized as additives in, in lubricant formulations. And just to give you an idea of performance and, and how we uh, design our products, you know, when we were coming out with our silicone, the specialist silicone, we uh, you know, tried to test it against some of the leading competitors in the marketplace on the four ball wear test. And again, this is the test that determines how great your product is at anti-wear. And so a smaller score is better. And you can see just the difference, right? So, I mean, 2.75 millimeter scar, uh, probably not protecting your, your surfaces very well. Uh, but 0.6, I could say is a great score. And that's uh, an area that we we're proud of is that we test our products. And if they're not right, if they're not the best they could be, uh, we, we develop and we, we go back to the drawing board. And so I just wanted to, to give you a sense of, uh, of security, knowing that you know, the products that we develop have a great sense of um, performance to them. So moving on to another category of products I want to bring up today, and I'm sure everyone here uses a lot of degreasers and cleaners as well. We offer a lineup of degreasers and cleaners, and I want to go into a little bit of the science behind these products and the unique applications as well. So. On this image, you can see there's uh, two aerosol products all the way to the left. And then there's uh, the non-aerosol, there's five of them to the right. The five non-aerosol products are actually the same formula. Uh, it's a water-based degreaser. We're gonna talk a lot about that one today. 
and we offer it in different uh, formats. You can see that there's two triggers. One of the triggers, a smaller one, has a refillable cap, which couples quite nicely to the one gallon. So you could just simply refill. You don't have to buy a new bottle, go to the store and buy another one. And then the two aerosols on the left are, are also degreasers, but they have unique attributes to them as well. So we'll, we'll touch on those. So what's the science behind uh, you know, water-based degreasers? And I'm sure everyone here has heard of some of the, the typical suspects. I have uh, some of them on here, Purple Power, Simple Green, Zep, right? Uh, we designed our product to be, uh, we want three categories of our product for our product to fit in, powerful, safe, and easy, right? And so the powerful part, uh, the chemistry is actually based on biosolvent technology. So there's really three main ingredients. There's palm kernel oil, coconut oil, and water. That's it. That's the three ingredients, uh, very bio-based. And a lot of people in the past have told me, well, you know, bio-based bio sounds really cool, but I'm not too sure if I feel confident that it gives me the performance that I need. Uh, I want those industrial chemicals that could really remove the heavy-duty grease. And it turns out with uh, lab me uh, test methods, standardized test methods, that's no longer true. You know, uh, advancements in chemistry have come a long way. And it turns out you can hit those uh, industrial performance and in removal of contaminants, even with bio-based technology. And so you can see that we have a, a similar score, if not better, than some of the typical suspects you'll see in the marketplace. The second attribute we focus on was safe. What does that mean? Uh, well, it means it has a lot of meanings to us. It's safe for the consumer, so safe for you. It's safe for the surfaces, and it's safe for the environment. And so the formula we have is safe for choice certified. And what that means is that we have a partnership with the EPA, which is the federal government. And they have a program that uh, reviews the formulation and audits your facility uh, for safe in use for the consumer. It's highly effective at cleaning, and it's also safe for the environment. So we're very proud of having a certification. And I highly recommend if you're looking to move towards bio-based products, look for that certification. The, li the logo's right there, the Safety First logo. That will literally appear on the package. So when you're in the store looking for products, if you prefer bio-based, that's the logo you want to look for. The product we develop is non-toxic. Non it's fully biodegradable. It's non-flammable. Again, it's water-based. We didn't add a fragrance to the product. It's low odor. Um, many of the times, the fragrance is... Uh, that, that you experience, if it has a citrus a fragrance to it, it's probably because they're adding a chemical called citric acid. Citric acid is a good additive to improve cleaning, but it actually can affect surfaces. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about surfaces. Uh, it's 50 state VOC compliant, so you don't have to worry about uh, whether the OSHA is gonna come in and tag you for having chemicals that don't belong. And actually, uh, as a quick aside, all the products that WD-40 company provides are 50 state VOC compliant. So you know, never have to worry about, no matter where you're from in the United States, having products in your shop that are not compliant. This particular formula is also NSF registered. What does that mean? Uh, so it's safe for use in food processing facilities. You can't use it on direct food contact, uh, but it can be used on machinery that exists in a food processing facility. And then as I said earlier, safe for surfaces. So uh, the images that you see on the bottom there are aluminum panels. And one of the things that we noticed is a lot of people had complaints in the market that uh, you know they buy these great degreasers, but they can't use them on some surfaces. They can't use them on their aluminum mag wheels. They can't use it on some of their shop surfaces. So we wanted to come out with a product that wasn't only safer; it was easier to use, simpler to use, and we don't have we don't want people worrying about whether they could spray it on a certain surface or not. And so we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail as well. And the last part of this was easy. So again, uh, you have this refillable package that you can refill, but also it's ready to use. So there's no messy diluting that's needed. A lot of these formulas will say concentrated, uh, but the fact is if it says concentrated on there, it probably means that yes, it is gonna have good performance, but it's not safe for all services. And if you read the label on the back and uh, look at the directions, they'll recommend dilution before you spray it on delicate surfaces like aluminum or glass. Uh, so this next slide here is, and I got asked this at the ASC conference a few years ago, uh, what should we look for when looking at a degreaser label or looking for a degreaser product? And so I wanted to provide some chemicals and a lot of degreaser products will list their ingredients right on the label or on the SDS document. So you can find that information there. But the first thing is acid. So again, I brought this up before, but citric acid, uh, again, it's great for balancing pH and improving your cleaning efficacy, but it, it can corrode surfaces and even stain them. Uh, so we're very proud that we're acid free and we're able to achieve the same levels of performance without the use of acid. 
The second part is sodium hydroxide or NaOH. Uh, sodium hydroxide is put in there again as a, um, a, PA, a pH buffer. And so it helps with cleaning and helps balance the formula. But the truth is there, there's other pH boosters you could use. And sodium hydroxide is corrosive to surfaces as well as your skin. Uh, I know people have come up to me and said, you know, I've used uh, this great degreaser, but when, I, when it gets on my skin, my skin feels slippery. The fact is that slippery feeling is actually the fats on your skin dissolving. And so if that's happening to your skin, it's not a good sign and you probably should be wearing gloves. And so again, sodium hydroxide, not one of the best ingredients you want in your products. The last one is metasilicates. Metasilicates are, are emulsifying agents, meaning that they keep the formula together. They keep it from, from separating. Uh, but, and you may see this as sodium uh, metasilicate, but the problem is, is that they're actually abrasive and they can etch glass or pit aluminum. And so we, we were able to achieve a uniform form formula without the use of metasilicates. And uh, so again, another, another uh, chemical to look out for. Um, so yeah, just a more high res image of the aluminum panels I was talking about earlier. So again, I applied all these products uh, as the label recommended, which is, you know, we spray it down, wait it, wait five minutes. In some cases, it was 10 minutes and you uh, rinse it with water and wipe it clean with a uh, clean rag. And you can see afterwards, you get some uh, noticeable effects on the metal, right? You know, purple power, super cleans up, not so great. I wouldn't want to use these formulas on some of the materials in my shop or aluminum parts. Uh, and you can clearly see that if you pay attention to the chemistry that you use, uh, a product, the product that we developed uh, really has no effect on the surface. So just to review, uh, water-based biodegradable formula uh, based on coconut oil and palm kernel oil, uh, safer choice certification, that logo, definitely look for that if you're looking for products that have high degree of performance uh, or more renewable energy in terms of using bio-based materials and are safe for, for, human, con uh, for human use. Our product, the other, um, uh, aspect I haven't brought up is actually it prevents flash rusting. And so what I'm showing here is an immersion test uh, after 360 hours. And the jars have the same type of steel panel in it. The jar on the right is filled with VI water and you can see that rust is starting to occur there. And on the right is the same panel just uh, soaked in our degreaser. And so what we learned is that those oils, uh, those biosolvents actually provide a uh, degree of corrosion protection that's really great. Um, a lot of these products, obviously water is one of the ingredients for corrosion, but they also have acids in them. And so they typically will promote corrosion in many cases. So it's great to know that not only don't we, don't we promote corrosion, we actually prevent it to a certain degree. Uh, this is my old BMW that I cleaned up. You could see uh, how nice it worked after just one application. And again, I didn't have to get worried about what surfaces I was going to damage. There's some aluminum parts, as you can see there. There's plastic, there's rubber, there's steel. Uh, it was quite nice to just be able to spray everything down, wipe it down uh, in one application without having to switch products or be aware of the surfaces I'm spraying on. So another uh, big category in the automotive industry is greases. I'm sure everyone here has uh, greased wheel bearings or fitments. Uh, so I just wanted to go into the science behind that as well. So what goes into a grease? There's really three main components that make up a grease. You have the base oil, the thickener, and the additives. Base oil makes up roughly 80 to 85% of your grease. Uh, again, it depends on the particular product, but uh, there's really two main types of base oils. There's your mineral oil, which is your typical petroleum-based oils, and then your higher performance synthetics, uh, similar to your motor oil, right? You have conventional oil versus fully synthetic. And then you have a thickener, makes up about 10% of your formula. And so you may have heard of the words like lithium or calcium sulfonate or polyurea. That's their thickener. So greases are categorized by their thickener. And you can have simple metal soaps, that's your lithium. You may have heard of lithium complex. Uh, complex is a, a, a step up from simple. Uh, the, what, the reason why complex is better is it allows the additives to, uh, uh, they're more compatible with additives. And so that makes the additives stronger. So complex typically have a uh, better performance aspect to them. And then you have non-soap thickeners as well. PTFE can actually be used as a thickener. Uh, and you may see that in uh, aerospace applications or electrical applications. And the last part could be zero to 5% is your additives, right? And it's, it's to enhance those desirable properties. It could be water resistancy, corrosion resistancy, extreme pressure, um, you know, tackiness. We've, we've seen the labels on products. And so you put those additives in, in your grease as well. 
the chart on the right is something um, that was interesting to me when I learned it, but the NLGI uh, developed a classification for the consistency of greases. And so you may have seen on a, a cartridge of grease, NLGI number two, and you probably ask yourself, what does that mean? Well, it's the consistency. And so number two is actually the most popular. It's the normal grease, they call it. Used in many applications, probably all you need to know in the automotive segment. Uh, but they do go from triple zero, which is a very fluid, uh, to six, which is basically a solid. And, and they have very specific applications, but I just want you to be aware of what that number means. And so we have a product under grease. It's the True Multipurpose Grease under the Specialist brand. It's actually a calcium sulfonate base. Calcium sulfonates are actually higher performance than lithium. And they're higher performance for many reasons, but the, the two main reasons are thermal stability as well as uh, water resistance and corrosion protection. And so if you look at that chart there, one of the uh, indicators of thermal stability is the drop point test. And you may have seen this, they typically print this right on the label of a grease cartridge. And so what the drop point test is, is they, the, the lab takes a copper cup that has a hole in the middle. They put the grease inside the cup and they heat it up incrementally every, every temperature until they see a drop of oil come out, drop point, right? And so when that drop of oil comes out, uh, that's the rating. And so you can see conventional lithium greases, 565 is actually quite high. Uh, they typically range about 500 to 550 degree Fahrenheit. Uh, and then, you know, calcium sulfonates will afford a higher drop point. So we actually go over 650 degrees Fahrenheit. 650 is actually the highest you can go. Uh, so we're very proud of the fact that we developed something that has superior and excellent thermal stability. And as I mentioned, uh, calcium sulfonates are, are better at water resistance and corrosion protection as well. Uh, okay, I mentioned uh, calcium sulfonate being a premium thickener, um, but one of the unique attributes of the product that we're offering is the fact that it uses the WD-40 uh, multi-use trade secret concentrate that you find in the blue and yellow can. And it actually gave us a property, uh, there's a bearing corrosion test for greases. Uh, it was the only test to pass the more rigorous bearing corrosion where we added 10% salt water instead of five. It passed that as well. And so uh, we're very proud of the, the product that we developed. We really believe it to be a true multi-purpose grease. And actually as a testament to the product, we did a, a sponsorship series with uh, uh, off-road truck racer Kyle LaDuke and we, we approached him and he was very skeptical at first and he kind of told us you know look I use a $40 product on my CV joints and on my bearings and I'm, I'm not willing to put a $8 tube of grease in there I, I don't believe it's going to work and I, I think he had the right standing there and what we told him is we signed a contract and basically said look if we damage your equipment uh, we will pay for it and we just want you to give it a run, uh, try it on the track uh, when you're practicing and let us know how it works. And you know, we had a video for this, but unfortunately the audio didn't work right. But what I could tell you is the result was amazing. He took apart the boot and took the, the, the bearings out and was, inspected the, uh, the wear and tear that was occurring. And essentially there was uh, little to none, uh, same performance that he was experiencing with that $40 product. And so the, the really the uh, learning here is that if you know the chemistry well enough, if you know what you're looking to develop, uh, you can get outcomes that are just as good, if not better, than a, a more expensive product. And so it, it's been great partnering up with someone who really has high power equipment that's really putting the product to the test. You know, this is a this is a test that you can't do in the lab, right? You can't do. I'm not an off-road uh, off truck racer. I don't have this type of power to deliver onto the grease to determine whether it's going to protect. And so this is this is the type of testing that WD-40 company prides itself on in order to make sure that we're delivering the best product for the end users. So I'm getting towards the end here and we'll leave some time for questions. Uh, but I do want to talk real quick about uh, product development and values and uh, what to look for when you're buying products for your shop and when your, your career takes off and you're buying tools. Uh, so WD-40 coming, just to go back a slide here, you know, these are our values and we literally live these values. They're, they're part of the core of not our company, but who we are individually in the company. And we value doing the right thing. And so I'm just going to talk about that one. And so that's bringing me to this slide. The first one is Prop 65 warning in California. So I'm, I brought this up before. You may have seen this in many places. I mean, you see it everywhere this morning. I've seen it going to Disneyland. I've seen it going on an airplane. Uh, because the fumes from the airplane. 
uh, you see it on products. So why does it occur on products? You may have seen it on some aerosol products or you may have seen it on SDS documents. And so the question is, uh, what does it mean? It, what it means is that there's chemicals that the state of California has determined to be carcinogenic, cause cancer. It could be a reproductive toxin, toxin or a mutagen, right? And we as a company decided that we're not going to develop or sell a product that has this statement on it. And so we go above and beyond to test our chemicals that go into our product to make sure that they're the safest possible for human use, uh, you know, because we care about the people using our products. Uh, we care about the people that are making our products and we just simply care. And it's about doing the right thing. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up is 50 state VOC compliance. So again, you don't have to worry about OSHA knocking on your door. Uh, when you use WD-40 company products, you could put store them uh, properly and you don't have to worry about them damaging the atmosphere because they're compliant with all the recent regulations. The last slide here is just a, uh, I leave this slide up for questions just in case there's any question about a product, uh, but I'd like to open the floor up for questions. I appreciate your time today and um, I hope everyone is enjoying the summer and is having, it will have a good weekend. Chris, real good. That was a real good walkthrough there of the science and the products related to it. We do have some questions. Dan, while you queue up a couple of questions there, I just want to remind the audience that the ASC test centers are starting to open up. It is a progressive process. For more details, please go to www.ase.com, look under the registration information to find out more details on test center availability. Dan, what you got? All right, Dave. Chris, uh, there were several questions about the gel lubricant. So I'd like to start there. First one uh, from Jason. He asked, does the gel lubricant have any penetrating properties? Yeah, so it's not gonna be the best penetrant, but I will say uh, we've gotten feedback from customers that they do use that as a penetrant. Um, if you really have a rusted mechanism though, that's really frozen and, and difficult to loosen up, not going to be your best product for that, right? You would want to use the penetrant, which is in the middle, uh, the red column there, uh, or WD-40. Uh, but it does have penetrating qualities. Uh, I wouldn't say that it won't work, uh, but it's not going to be your optimal product. And then also on the gel lubricant, is the gel lubricant safe on rubber bushings? That comes from Dominic. Yes, it is. Um, and so with actually we had a video in the, the presentation I did on Monday that showed application uh, to more to rubber bushings. Uh, typically uh, people use silicone, uh, going back to silicone, silicone is very non-reactive to these types of services, uh, you know, rubber and plastics, but you can use the gel, it'll last much longer. Um, and so yeah, the answer is yes. And then from Richard, uh, he asks if you could elaborate a little bit about the testing and the test procedures on the chemicals and about how long does it take one of the products to go through those test procedures? Yeah, so going back to the lubricating series, so the, the four ball wear test, that's an hour long test. So uh, that's a specified amount of time. The extreme pressure test, it really depends. You know, I run these tests all the time on a weekly basis, I'm in the lab running them. Uh, if you have a poor product that only hits like 300 to like 500 pounds, the test is over in about a minute. Uh, WD-40 typically hits about 1,200, 1,400 pounds. That, that might run, uh, you know, five minutes. Uh, so it's a quite quick test. The, the highest it goes is 4,500. And you'll hit 4,500. You know what product actually goes that far is the dry lubricants. The dry lubricants are really great at extreme lubrication, or sorry, extreme pressure lubrication because they have more of a physical uh, molecular barrier versus a liquid barrier. Several of the attendees uh, live in uh, uh, the cancer rust belt type thing uh, of our country as well as Canada um, and internationally as a matter of fact and they're asking about what chemicals offer the best resistance against the salt and the brine that are being used now. Oh yeah, that's a good question. So I, there's two products on here that I used on my own vehicle and I have friends that use it on their motorbikes and, and anything really, it could be a lawnmower or whatever it is. Uh, but the gel lubricant is great. 
Uh, so what's nice about the smart straw is you could flip it down and then you get a more wide application. So you could go underneath your car, spray all the sensitive areas that you're worried about getting corroded. But if you look on the right hand side of this slide, it, there's a rust, rust maintenance bucket. The small aerosol there is a long term corrosion inhibitor. That product's uh, only purpose is to prevent corrosion for a long period of time. And so that's a great product for storage, for going out in the elements. Um, I know I've sprayed down uh, some of my sensitive parts of my car, you know. November uh, before they start putting the brine down on the road. And yeah, it really does a great job of protecting your vehicles uh, or any sensitive equipment from corrosion. Then backing that up, uh, Roosevelt asks, uh, with the vast list of WD-40 products, is there a place that they can go to determine which product would be the best application for their use? Absolutely. So, yeah, that's that's a great question. So I would WD40.com. It actually uh, has all these products on there, and again, there's a there's a, quite a bit of guides on there for what your what problem you're dealing with. So if you're an automotive professional, it'll give you applications for each of these products, even some videos of um, you know people using the product and how they uh, were able to accomplish some of their problems. Uh, so yeah, WD40.com is your best bet if, you're, if you have uh, an issue that you're dealing with and you're wondering what product's the best, that we provide that information on the website. Joe and several others have asked, which of the uh, WD40 products are the best for dealing with the polyurethane bushings, especially ones that may squeak a little bit? Yeah, so I like to recommend silicone for that uh, because yeah, gel is also great. Uh, silicone has the best um, durability with temperature, though. Uh, so if those those bushings are going to get hot, uh, silicone will be able to resist. And also, they have quite a bit of water resistance to it, silicone. That's the other thing I forgot to bring up earlier. Uh, silicone versus petroleum, uh, silicone is just much more water resistant. Uh, so it's great for you know exposure to the elements. And then many of the attendees have asked uh, regarding the um, uh, safe, if they're, they're safe on painted finishes, uh, if painted finishes can be damaged by the products. Yeah, so I, I always get this question, so it's a good one. Um, the one product that you cannot use on surfaces to be painted is silicone. Do not, and this, this goes for any product, not just, you know, our silicone, just in general. Always check the products you're using. Uh, don't have silicone in a body shop or whatever the case is, because if you paint over silicone, you'll get an effect called fish eyes. And so the pigments won't adhere properly. Otherwise, for the most part, to be honest with you, uh, everything's compatible with painted surfaces. Um, you know, it, it, it's difficult, I, I, you know, to say, you know, for, talk for other companies and their products. I think water-based degreasers and cleaners are okay for the most part, uh, but I would be skeptical about uh, some contact cleaners, they may have solvents in them that are strong and may remove coatings. Uh, same thing with just aerosol degreasers or solvent-based degreasers. So just be aware uh, around those areas, uh, but general lubricants should be okay. And here's a question. Uh, Dylan asks if you could restate uh, what you talked about on the chlorinated uh, chlorination of the chemicals and the safety there. Okay, yeah, I didn't I actually didn't touch on chlorination. So chlorinated chemicals are bad, uh, just to keep it simple. Uh, I know a lot of brake cleaners, people uh, have cried to me about how, uh, you know, chlorinated, the chlorinated stuff back in the day is better. Uh, okay, it might be better at cleaning, but it's not good for you. Uh, do not use chlorinated products. Uh, go to non-chlorinated, they still clean very well. Um, and the reason for that is they're highly carcinogenic. And I know I, I've worked in a shop before, and I, I'll have to admit I was wearing safety glasses and gloves, but I wasn't wearing a respirator all the time. And so unless you're gonna wear a respirator all the time, you're likely gonna be exposed to these chemicals. A lot of states are starting to ban the use of chlorinated products, uh, but please do me a favor and stay away. And also uh, read SDS documents. If you find a new product that you like, most of the time if you're shopping for it on Granger, Fastenal, Napa, whatever it may be, the SES is posted on their website. Take a look and look at section 14, and it'll tell you whether there's carcinogens in the product or not. Chris, this is Dave. I'm just going to jump in for a second there. Speaking of SDS, the 
old fashioned MSDS as it was called. Are those all available on the WD-40 site? Yes, that's correct for every product. Okay, and then um, I need to, Dave got my sidetrack there. Oh, there it is. Uh, it does heat, uh, this is from Chris, does heat help a penetrant work? Um, you know, it's kind of hard to say. So the thing is, is heat will reduce the viscosity of a, of a fluid, right, of a lubricant. And so it'll have a more ability, a higher ability to flow. Uh, so it can, it can help. Uh, but to be honest with you, um, you know, I worked in a shop and one of the things that we used to do is take out the blue torch when there was an issue. Uh, sometimes the blue torch is not always the best solution because it could warp with the metal. And then you don't get the same, even if you are able to get the fastener back into its fixture, it's not going to give you the same uh, fastening ability. And so I, I always either bought new hardware or used the penetrant because I, I was always worried about warping my hardware. Uh, it can help, but likely you're, you know, do not heat up an aerosol can. Uh, they're under pressure. Uh, they can rupture. Uh, I would recommend just using it at the temperature of the shop. Don't, don't, uh, it's not, it's not going to give you enough performance to make a difference. And then from Gabriel and a few others, they ask about on the gel lubricant, is there an issue with dust and dirt sticking to the gels more so than the other liquid lubricants? Yeah, so that is one area that um, you know you have to think about, right? Because the gel is going to stay there, and it's it is uh, a bit tacky, and so uh, it it will collect dirt and dust over time. If you're working in an environment where there's a lot of dirt and dust, as I mentioned, the a dry lube would be your best choice. Uh, so yeah, I mean any lubricant will eventually build up dirt and dust, uh, and that's that was actually the genesis of the dry lube, which is okay if if you're dealing with that problem, we have a solution for you, and so. Uh, yeah. And then um, I'll find my notes here. And then Don asks about um, the use of WD-40, a WD-40 product, what specific product might be able to be used in an electron electrosonic uh, system for cleaning for like carburetors, cylinder heads, engine components. Is there something like that available? And is it available? Yeah, if so is it available in large containers? Oh, okay, so we have two products and actually one of them is not on the slide. So if you look all the way to the left, uh, the green one there is the contact cleaner. So that'll be great for cleaning those electrical components. But we actually also sell a throttle body and carburetor cleaner in aerosol as well. Unfortunately, we don't offer them in anything bigger than aerosol, uh, but we do have those two products. Okay, and then you handle the dirt and debris. Oh, and then Jerry asked, uh, will the WD-40 evaporate if used as a lubrication on the exhaust manifold bolts? So that's a good, very good question. So yeah, it does get hot, the exhaust manifold. And so a lot of the components that make up WD-40 will evaporate. However, there's materials in there that will not. And so even though you'll, it'll heat up, uh, it'll leave behind some lubricating components that will still be active material. Uh, so it's it's kind of um, half and half. Uh, a lot of the times, the the solvents that are used in products will flash or evaporate quite quickly with heat. Uh, but again, the active materials require much higher level, degree of heat in order to evaporate. Okay, and then I just lost it. They keep popping in. Um, let me find it here. It was gel. You did the heat. 
Oh, uh, dry lubricant. Mark was asking about that and asking if it would be a good choice for, say, like the lift arms on the hoist, uh, especially in a shop, in his case, that, that has a lot of metal grinding going on. Uh, I'm sorry, that was for the gel lubricant? Uh, the dry lubricant. Yeah, it is great for that. Um, again, if you're in that environment where you're worried about contaminating the, the, or trying to keep dirt and dust away, uh, it's great for those, the, those services as well, yes. Okay, and I think that pretty much wraps up where we're going. So I'm gonna pass this back over uh, to Dave. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it very much there, Dan. Thank you. <clears throat> A big high five to Chris for today's insightful presentation. Seeing the science behind everyday lubricants and related products helps to understand their need and application. This webcast was brought to you by ASE and the ASE Education Foundation. For announcements about upcoming sessions, keep an eye on your email inbox. On behalf of Chris Aiello, John Tisdale, and Dan Baumhart, I'm Dave Capert, and this concludes today's webcast. We hope to see you online at another event soon. So long, everyone. Have a good weekend. <laughs>